Hello and welcome everyone. You've reached the Cyverse Focus Forum webinar series. I am Tina Lee, Cyverse's User Engagement Officer. Today's webinar is on Plant CV, a modular image analysis toolkit for building plant phenotyping workflows, presented by Noah Falgren, who's the director of the core science facility of the Danforth Plant Science Center. For those of you new to Cyverse, we are an NSF funded cyber infrastructure project and this free webinar series is designed to fulfill a key part of our mission to train scientists on how to use Cyverse's computational resources. First, I'm gonna quickly take care of some housekeeping before we start the webinar. Today's presentation is roughly 30 minutes with time for Q&A at the end. Please open the Zoom chat window and type your questions there for Noah. I'll read them at the end. The slides and webinar video recording will be posted later today on our website's uh, webinar page for you to review at any time. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic radically changed our ability to travel, Cyverse was working on tweaking our training materials and events to accommodate remote or online learning to reach a wider audience. So please watch our website for more information on those resources. And now I'm pleased to introduce Noah Falgren of the Donald Danforth Plant Science Center in St. Louis, Missouri. Like many of you who now find yourselves doing computational-based research, Noah's background is in domain science, biology. He did his doctoral work in molecular and cellular biology, doing a lot of high-throughput sequencing on Solexa machines, which is the precursor to what most of you know as Illumina machines. A believer and practitioner of open source software and reproducible research, Noah and his team built Plant Computer Vision, Plant CV for short, with public funding and have made it accessible to all. Welcome, Noah. Thanks, Tina. Thanks for the invitation um, to do this webinar. I know, I think you and I talked about this sometime last year before we heard of, about COVID-19. Um, and I think these kind of, um, you know, online webinars are really important for making sure science is accessible to everybody. But I think, you know, obviously, particularly under, um, you know, the current global situation, it's even more important. So Absolutely. glad to be here. Thank you for doing this. Um, I'm just going to start by, uh, I want to start with acknowledgments. Um, I've got a great group of people that work with me at the Danforth Center. And so we run the, the data science uh, core facility. Um, and in particular, I'll, I'll mention quite a bit about what Haley does because she's our primary plant CV developer in the team. Um, but I'll point out other people along the way as we go. Um, and also particularly point out the Guillen Lab. There are our close collaborators on plant CV um, since the beginning when we started, started building it. Um, and then we have uh, a lot of collaborators from around the world really that help us um, develop plant CV or um, improve it along the way. And, and this group of people changes over time, you know, as, as, um, as, as people come and go and whatnot, but these are kind of the current people that are um, really active right now and helping us out. And, and of course, have to um, thank the funding agencies. We have, we've been lucky to have a lot of um, diverse funding sources um, for plant CV work, um, both in developing it and, and utilizing it in different projects. So the goals for today's webinar, um, I'm just gonna give a, sort of a background about plant CV and sort of what it can do. And um, I'll also point out along the way, ways that um, you all can, can help contribute to plant CV. Um, and, give some brief examples of uh, what can be done with Plant CV, although hopefully you actually figure out um, new and interesting ways to use Plant CV that we didn't even necessarily intend. And um, I'll talk a, a lot about uh, how do you, where you can use Plant CV and how we've uh, tried to tie it into um, different cyber infrastructures um, and cloud computing resources. So um, the reason that our group has been so focused on uh, building plant phenotyping tools is bec 
because of, um, you know, over the last two decades, um, we've had this revolution in DNA sequencing. And so probably all of you have seen uh, a graph like this before, but this is just showing the cost of uh, DNA sequencing um, dropping rapidly over the last two decades. And so when we think about um, the kinds of things we need to measure to to um, like help us in crop breeding and improvement, uh, we can measure genotype, I'll say fairly easily. Uh, I'm not saying it's it's always the easiest, but um, it's you know become relatively inexpensive to measure genotype. Uh, but the phenotype is this integration of genetic components and the environment and management practices uh, over time. So this makes phenotyping actually pretty challenging to do um, because traditionally we've had to do it do it manually. Um, so with high throughput phenotyping using imaging, our goal is to make phenotyping more quantitative. Uh, and increase the spatial and temporal resolution that we can measure plant phenotypes at. Uh, and then we also have the advantage that because if we can do this, we can um, measure phenotypes without destroying the plant material. And all of these things help us reduce the cost of phenotyping, ideally. So less people time measuring phenotypes, uh, less materials that have to be used to um, to measure the phenotypes and therefore we can have more, we can have bigger experiments um, and measure things um, more frequently over time. At the Danforth Center, we're lucky to have a lot of um, unique phenotyping platforms to, to develop these tools around. So, um, in 2013, we opened this uh, bellwether phenotyping facility. This is a Lemnotech system. So the plants are moving around on conveyor belt system. This was kind of our first um, entrance into phenotyping and, and why we ended up developing software uh, for it. Um, and our group is not directly involved necessarily with all of these systems, um, but people are doing a lot of different kinds of phenotyping uh, both you know almost at the um, the tissue or even cellular level all the way up to field scale work like with the terror rough project um, if you saw david labauer's uh, cybers webinar a couple weeks ago um, you'll have seen a lot about the terror rough system and if not his videos online so you should go go check that out um the main thing though with all these systems is they allow us to screen a relatively large number of plants and sometimes with different interesting modalities so um you know rgb cameras and hyperspectral cameras and the x-ray ct systems and, and so on that give us um you know unique insight into plant phenotype so they um those those kind of commercial platforms are, are great, um, but they are quite expensive. And so the other important thing for us is uh, phenotyping platforms that don't require this, this big uh, monetary investment. And so we do a lot with Raspberry Pi computers. So these uh, are 35 US dollar computers uh, that you can attach a, an approximately $25 a US dollar a camera module to, and then you have an autonomous uh, camera system that's relatively affordable that you can, um, you know, use to outfit whole growth chambers with. And so we use these a lot um, throughout our plant growth facilities for automated data collection. Um, and, you know, and in some ways you actually have higher throughput with these than you do with the commercial systems just because you can you can have so many plants growing under them. Um, they obviously have downsides where, uh, you know, because you're not separating the plants out, once they overgrow each other, uh, there's more limited data you can collect. But, um, you know, in terms of simultaneous data collection on small plants, it's actually quite, 
quite nice. Um, and I'll point you to this paper uh, from Leah's group from a couple of years ago uh, that they published with some protocols for how to set up um, these Raspberry Pi systems for data collection. So uh, because of all of these platforms, uh, we decided to um, that there was a need to build our own software to analyze plant image data, starting with data from our own uh, Lemnatech system, but quickly kind of expanding out into um, a lot of other imaging systems. And so our vision for these phenotyping tools is that uh, they would be modular and reusable. Uh, we didn't want to just build a one-off thing that could only work with our own systems. Uh, we wanted it to be useful to, to everybody. Um, and we wanted uh, the tools to be usable by both the bioinformaticians and data scientists, but also biologists. And so um, in building Plant CV, we sort of had um, these guidelines for ourselves that, that we try to follow. Um, so we wanted Plant CV to be this common interface to collect image analysis techniques from other packages. We don't want to reinvent the wheel for everything. So we're combining these tools together. And that lets us uh, build a common common interface around them so that you're not having to go out and read the documentation for um, you know, 10 different tools that can be kind of found under one place. And the modularity lets us build um, these tools sort of in a flexible way um, that makes it easier to combine in new tools uh, and, and hopefully helps us more rapidly disseminate these methods to the community. Um, we also wanted this to be like a network of collaborators. We don't see Plant CV as something that we develop by ourselves. We want to develop this with the community and that's why we do this openly um, on platforms like GitHub. Um, and then importantly too, we are, I, I particularly think that image analysis is actually a really cool training opportunity uh, for students um, and such, because it's such a visual um, type of data analysis. I, I think it's it's a sort of easier to understand, like um, as you as you learn the techniques, um, what the algorithms are actually doing, because you can see the results. Oops, sorry. So uh, Plant CV is, um, is a Python package, and we combine in a lot of um, Python packages from the scientific Python community, um, along with some other tools. And so uh, these are some of the things we consider strengths of Plant CV. So it's modular, um, which I'll show a bit more in a minute. Um, our belief is that it's well documented. So every component of Plant CV has documentation, and this has been improved on, um, you know, over time by ourselves. And then all the people that come in and use Plant CV have often given us, um, you know, advice and stuff about how to improve the documentation, which has really helped. It's open source. It has an MIT license, so you can use Plant CV for both academic and commercial purposes without any restrictions. Um, we develop openly on GitHub, and so this means that um, people always have access to the latest version. Uh, we do user support through GitHub issues, and um, this helps us build a community of contributors because uh, those contributors can directly um, so, um, uh, improve the code on GitHub. Um, Right, and then it's it's cross-platform, so this will work on Mac OS, Windows, Linux, whatever your preferred system is. Um, because it's open source, in a lot of ways, we we only know who's using Plant CV when um, you know we're directly talking to people, 
Uh, but we do keep metrics about um, sort of who's accessing it, like in a broad sense. And so we know it's been downloaded more than 20,000 times. Um, and we can see sort of how many people are interacting with it on GitHub and things like that. Um, so we don't know, obviously, precise numbers, and there's caveats to all these statistics, but um, we do have, you know, these evidence that people are downloading it and using it. Um, and then importantly, uh, we look at sort of as an end result, um, papers that are being published uh, where we've enabled people to do some research. So we've got four of our own papers describing new aspects of Plant CV. And then um, what's really exciting to us is the 15 user papers. So these are not necessarily our own papers. These are other people that are using Plant CV in their research. Um, you'll have this information later, but you can access uh, Plant CV and its documentation through plantcv.dampercenter.org um, and directly access the code on GitHub. So I just want to spend a minute talking about um, our how our development platform works, um, because some of you may be interested in contributing to Plant CV, and that could work at a lot of different levels, both code, documentation, or even just um, suggestions for features that are missing that would help your research. Um, the way this works is locally, someone would have um, a copy of Plant CV from GitHub, and they develop a new feature. They would create what's called a pull request um, through GitHub. So this creates a, um, a, a comparison of your code to the current version of Plant CV. And that triggers uh, a build process that runs on the Travis CI infrastructure. So this, this sets up a new um, server, installs Plant CV based on your version and then runs through all of the tests that we have built into um, Plant CV. The tests, if they all pass, uh, then go off to coverage analysis. So this looks at how many lines of code were actually utilized during the test. Uh, we currently have about 100% code coverage. And this is important because if you don't have, if you actually don't test components of your code, you don't. You, your test can pass, but you don't actually know whether that code is working or not. And so we try to maintain this high level of coverage so that when we're updating Plant CV, and this is you know, potentially being updated by people from all over the place um, in a decentralized way, uh, we can ensure that the next version of Plant CV that will be released um, is functioning as best as we can tell from our tests. So if these two checks pass, we can merge the code into um, the main version of Plant CV, although we do code review, um, so um, kind of like peer review. And uh, once the merge is done, a new version of the documentation is built. And then periodically, about once a month, we release an official version, which uh, is archived on Zenodo and then deployed through the Python package index, Bioconda, and Docker. And this lets you install Plant CV um, using simple commands um, on, on official versions. So uh, I'm just going to briefly go over some of the, the main features of Plant CV um, that sort of exist today. And so um, we have some basic image analysis techniques built in. This is kind of a core of Plant CV. So this would involve things like uh, conversion between different color spaces, uh, thresholding tools that you would use to uh, identify plant pixels and non-plant pixels, for example. But then, as well as you can see, you often need to, um, sorry, you often need to clean up some of the backgrounds. So we have a lot of uh, features that help you filter out the uh, mislabeled background pixels. So things like, um, you know, uh, filter op like morphological operators and other things. 
And then also spatial filtering tools like regions of interest that help you define where in a picture you have um, your plants versus other things. And then once you've uh, identified only plant pixels, we can uh, do all sorts of um, measurements. So things like shape analysis, so like area of the plant, uh, width and height, and um, and other kinds of like those measurements. And then also uh, things like spectral analysis. So for RGB images, we're looking at the color values. Uh, if we had other kinds of images like thermal images, these would be temperature values and things and so on. And so kind of the main thing we're talking about today is, is how to how to use plant CV uh, in a more direct sense. And so the way we think about this is that plant CV is used to build workflows. So the plant CV library is a set of modular functions. The idea is that each function can do one simple task and the outputs of one task can be the inputs of the next task. And so you build these modules together into a workflow. So this is an example workflow that's diagrammed um, here. Um, I've intentionally made it a somewhat more complicated workflow just to show um, that you know these don't have to they, these can be as complicated as you need them to be. In this case, we have um, an input image that is an image of our plant, but we also have a, like a background image that is a, a empty pot and car and things like that. And so we can process these two images within the workflow and we end up subtracting um, this background image from the foreground image. Uh, and then any, once we can identify the plant pixels in this picture from these two inputs, then we can do all the, the measurement um, analyses we wanna do. So in this case, the shape, uh, a height analysis and then color. And so the way we build these workflows, primarily, it's a little bit up to the user, but most of us um, are composing workflows using Jupyter Notebooks. And in this video, I'm showing an example of launching a Jupyter Notebook system uh, on the binder platform. So this is directly from our GitHub repository, you can launch this. Um, or within our documentation, we have direct links to the binder system. Uh, the nice thing about this is you don't have to install anything. You don't have to have a user account. You can uh, immediately use our plant CV tutorials through binder. Um, and you can see how we use Jupyter Notebooks to build these workflows. And the great thing about the Jupyter system is that you um, you can directly visualize the outputs of each plant CV step. And uh, uh, if you don't like what your iterative uh, visual process for building workflows. This is a very similar uh, video that I'm gonna show here, but this is doing the same thing using Cyverse's discovery environment. So I'm logging into the discovery environment and then I'm gonna open the application dialog box. I'm gonna search for the Plant CV app by searching for Plant CV. And uh, this app is built using Cyverse's Vice interface. Um, in this case, I'm selecting an input folder of um, of our tutorial notebooks that we have hosted on Cybers. So I'm finding the Danforth Center shared folder. Uh, it's in the community folders and I'm attaching the sample notebook folder. And then we're launching the analysis and you'll get a notification up here in the top right. You can click on the link to open the session, you'll get a waiting window for a little while while it loads. And then when it's ready, you'll be logged into the VICE system. And this is uh, the Jupyter Lab interface. 
So if you open the work folder that's on the left, you'll see the sample notebook folder that we loaded at the input stage. And then you can open one of these notebooks from our tutorials and the image data associated with the notebooks is already, is already loaded in here. And so you can directly run the example code we have um, without any data of your own. But I, importantly too, you can load your own data into the app and uh, use our tutorials with your own data and, and model modify for your own purposes or just build your own notebooks um, from scratch. And what's not currently present in the Cyverse app um, that we're still working on is the parallelization piece. So once you write a plant CV workflow, uh, you likely have a data set you want to run the workflow on. And so your workflow ends up becoming a sort of a plant CV application that you want to run in parallel. But currently the way that works is we have a script that comes with plant CV called plant CV workflow. And this will execute your, your application on uh, an image data set in parallel. And so the idea is we want to run each image through the workflow. It also collects metadata about each image and combines that with the uh, measurements from plant CV. And then um, it also lets the user filter which images are going to be analyzed. Right now, this runs on, um, you can run this on any single server anywhere you have access to run things. Um, but where we'd like to go in the near future, and we have a USDA grant to work on this, is uh, expanding these capabilities more. And so what we'd like to do is replace this parallelization system with a uh, workflow engine. And there's a lot of existing ones that are um, potentially interesting to tie into um, that I won't go into today, but these would let us run plant CV workflows in parallel on lots of different infrastructures that you may have locally or in the cloud. Um, but Cyverse is another, uh, is another route for this that we want to develop where you can build your workflow in the vice interface like we just saw, and then deploy your workflow on your image data set through the discovery environment. So with the remaining time, I just want to go through a few brief uh, examples of how to use, how we've used Plant CV um, to do different kinds of analysis um, problems. It's not the only the only things that can or have been done, but uh, just hopefully some uh, useful examples that might get you inspired on how you could use Plant CV for your own data. Um, so if you use Plant CV to measure kind of the, the basic things I was talking about early on, like um, like leaf area is actually it's one of the easiest things we can measure. Um, but it's actually quite powerful and it's almost always used in people's projects. Um, so in this upper left panel, we're looking at a heat map of the projected leaf area of um, a population of plants over time. So time is the x-axis. And the darker it is, the bigger the plant is. So not surprisingly, the plants grow over time. But this data, because we have uh, a time series, we can use the data to then model additional traits. So in this case, we can fit um, like a logistic growth curve onto these, these plants um, leaf area time series, and then estimate things like absolute growth rate, uh, relative growth rate, um, and, and other things like that. So these become a whole set of additional traits that we can measure. So uh, we have plant CV measurements and then modeled phenotypes. And when we do it on population scales like this, then we can do um, you know, QTL mapping, genome-wide association studies, um, and other things like that. Another example, um, in this case, actually it's still a fairly simple analysis because we're just using um, a single phenotype like like the color of the plants. 
Uh, in this uh, study, Jingguo had infected Arabidopsis plants, either wild type or different RNA silencing mutant uh, genotypes of Arabidopsis. Uh, he infected them with turnip crinkle virus. And the goal here was just to monitor viral infection uh, non-destructively using plant color as a way to look at plant health. And so um, we built plant CV workflows to process these uh, single plant images that he had. And then we measured color using a uh, hue, which is just an absolute measure of the color of a pixel uh, measured around a color wheel. And so you can see in these um, ridge plots that um, these are actually colored by the hue value. So not surprisingly, healthy plants that are not infected with virus stay healthy and they're green because plants are green. Um, but plants infected with the wild type virus uh, become infected. And when they do, they, they are not so healthy. So they turn you know, yellow, orange. And so we can quantify how much of the plant is sort of healthy or unhealthy or infected or not infected uh, using this color curve. Uh, and a relatively new feature in plant CV that Haley's developed uh, as another example is trying to do some more detailed analysis than just looking at leaf area. And so this morphology package that she developed lets us, um, particularly with grass species, segment the plant into um, component architecture. And so she, uh, can identify the tips of leaves and stems in the plant, and then use uh, path segmentation to identify the different path components of the plant, and then convert those into stem and leaf paths. Um, after which then she can do a lot of different measurements like the leaf path lengths, um, the curvature of the leaves, the angle between the leaves and the stems and other um, properties of the, the leaf architecture. And the last couple of things I'll talk about um, revolve around some machine learning tools that we have built into Plant CV or are building into Plant CV. And so this is a brief example of using a simple uh, machine learning classifier that's already built into Plant CV, where the goal here is with these wheat leaves that are infected with rust um, to identify the segment this these pictures into um, green leaf, yellow chlorotic leaf, uh, the kind of orange red uh, fungal pustules, uh, and then remove all the background. So we do this by clicking or by collecting RGB color information from different regions of the, um, the picture. We just use the ImageJ uh, pixel inspector tool to collect samples of color values. And then we uh, use our classifier to, um, to build a model to separate these features apart. And then this lets us uh, directly segment the input color picture into component classes. So you can see that uh, we can label each pixel as either the green, the yellow, or the pustule part of the, the leaves, and then quantify the differences between uh, different genotypes in terms of how infected they are. Uh, sometimes, though, the simple statistical classifiers don't uh, quite work. So, you know, in the case where we have, say, Arabidopsis plants, in this example, where we want to um, segment the different leaves, we can't use a simple property like color to do that. Uh, so in those, in these kind of cases, we need to, to use uh, tools like deep learning. And so uh, we've been working a lot with the MASK uh, RCNN framework. Um, that was developed out of the, uh, the deep learning community, um, along with training data that was developed by others um, to uh, use mask RCNN to do leaf segmentation. But then what, what we've been working on adding into plant CV is the ability to track leaves over time using these segment, segmented images. 
So we want to be able to um, to link back through the time series that this leaf is this leaf is this leaf, and so on, so that we can build like individual leaf growth curves. This is still a bit of a work in progress, but um, something we're hoping to to have done soon. Final point is um, the other part of our USDA project is to add in uh, hyperspectral data analysis tools into plant CV. Um, and then we're also lucky to get to work with Mao Li, who develops topological data analysis tools um, in the plant phenotyping community. So um, her work is largely done in MATLAB, and we're working with her to um, bring some of these MATLAB tools into plant CV. Uh, particularly as a starting place, um, the work she's done on persistent homology, which lets her compare uh, plant architecture at different scales um, and between diverse um, diverse architectures, say like shoots and roots and, and things like that. Um, but more immediately for hyperspectral data analysis, um, Haley Scholl, again in the group, and Hu Dan Yoon from Malia's group have been working on um, developing the hyperspectral package that's currently available on Plant CV. And so this lets us read in hyperspectral data cubes. Uh, and we built a special data class for these objects, or for these um, hyperspectral images um, that combines both the actual like image data. The, so it's three dimensional data where you have the the two spatial dimensions and then the spectral dimension in our case has close to a thousand discrete wavelengths associated with it. Um, but importantly for us, it also combines like image metadata with the hyperspectral data because it's important to know what the wavelengths um, are that are associated with the, um, the spectral channel of your images. This lets us do things like flexible wavelength selection. And I, what I mean by that is um, we wrote Plant CV using our own hyperspectral data, but you, you might have a different hyperspectral camera with different wavelengths uh, supported by the camera. And this will let you, um, you know, build things like spectral indices, like NDVI, for example, uh, without having the exact same wavelengths that our camera has. And so, the goal is that this would be a flexible tool that anyone with hyperspectral data could use. Uh, so with that, um, very brief introduction. Uh, I just say um, my to summarize that um, we've tried to develop Plant CV as this unified interface uh, for a wide range of, of tools. And so, um, you know, again, the purpose there is you can go out and use OpenCV and uh, Scikit Image and all of these other tools, and they're great. But to use them all, you have to kind of learn how each of them works independently. And we think that where PlantCV fits in is unifying the interface around these tools. Um, because of the way we designed PlantCV in terms of its modularity, uh, means you can, and because it's written in Python, you can. You don't have to stick with only Plant CV. You can combine Plant CV with other image analysis tools within the, the Python community. Um, and I definitely would like to encourage both users and developers to help us improve Plant CV. Uh, users often help us by uh, pointing out like pain points or missing features and other things that help us improve Plant CV. Uh, and then we also, um, you know, have people who come in and want to develop new features themselves, and that's that's awesome. And we we highly encourage that. We want this to be a community effort. Uh, we don't want to be the only ones that develop this. So that's how we think it's going to be most useful to the community. Thanks for thanks for listening, and and thanks for um, thanks for being here. And I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful, Noah. Thank you so much. Um, we do have several questions, so I'll read those now. And um, yeah, it's great. Let's see. Uh, oops. Uh, 
we have a question that if you contribute new features or code, what is the process for adding the appropriate tests for Travis CI slash coveralls? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there, there's a there's a lot of different options. So we we know most most people who want to add a feature and, and they build it themselves, they they know how to they know how to build the the science part of it, right? The code that does the function. Um, and then, you know, the documentation and the testing is kind of its own, its own skill. And we know that not everyone's going to want to work on those parts. And so we're willing to help, help build those parts, um, or, or just work with people to train them how to do it themselves. It really kind of depends on their interests and what they like to do. Um, but the tests are, are modular. So there's, we have like a, a folder of example input data that's contained within the GitHub repository. And those inputs are used uh, within the tests. And the tests just run the function with this known input and a, and a known output. Um, but so, you know, we, we definitely help a lot of people write tests as we go. And, and the documentation too, it's not everyone's favorite thing to do. And it's that's important, but yeah. Okay. Um, the next question is, could you explain more about your algorithm for edge detection? Right. So I think we're, the only edge detection algorithm we're currently using is the canny edge detector. Um, that's, you know, just because that's been the one that's happened or that we've happened to need, but there's definitely a lot out there. Um, I think we're using the edge, the canny edge detector from the scikit image package. I'm not sure if that kind of answered all of your questions about that, but. Okay. Um, do you have any idea of the timeline of when the workflow feature will be added to the Cyverse app? I think that would be an awesome uh, app to use in classes I'll be teaching this spring or next spring. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Hopefully soon, <laughs> and that's not a great answer. Um, so in February, I was talking to Eric Lyons about this and it's just something I need to reach out to his group to talk about again. Um, we were talking about using using Makeflow because uh, that's something that Cybers has been looking into to using, I think. Um, yeah, not sure. Not sure, but uh, in talking with him and others at Cybers, it sounds like it's very doable. So I, I think we just need to invest the time in getting it done. Yes, we on, have. Our, on our end. <laughs> on our end too. All right, but um, yeah. So uh, another question is: Does plant CV work only for leaves, or can it be used for other tissues and/or organs such as grain or roots? Great question. Um, yeah, I should have, so we've used it for seed phenotyping, for sure. Um, we haven't used it a lot with roots, and I think that's primarily just because there are there are already a lot of root phenotyping packages out there. Um, so the plant CV would will work on roots because it doesn't really care what kind of image data it is per se, um, but there are in the root phenotyping community, there are a lot of specialized algorithms for measuring specific root traits like uh, roots, root diameter and root number. And I would say we don't really have those tools right now in Plant CV, but that's certainly something that would be great to have. Um, you know, I, with the caveat that I also don't want to necessarily reinvent what other people in that community are working on. Um, so I, you know, I'd point out like um, Larry York and Alex Bush's groups both developed some great tools around root phenotyping, uh, among others. Right. Alex Bush is one of our uh, collaborators and his um, platform is called DIRT, Digital Imaging of Root Traits. So you can find that on Cyrus as well. Okay. Uh, 
Let's see, regarding virus infection detection in case of tobacco rattlevirus assays, virus detection is centered in the root of the plant. Is it possible to get quantification of the virus in roots as well? And then maybe you addressed that earlier, that it would be better done through one of those specific root imaging platforms. Yeah, well, there would just come down to like, I guess it's, I mean, the one thing with image analysis is you have to kind of be able to see the, the phenotype. So if you had like a tagged version of the virus with like GFP or something, um, I could imagine that, but, but perhaps there is a, an obvious visual phenotype with, uh, with that virus. Okay. In, in which case, potentially you definitely could measure it with plant CV or, the, or other similar things. Okay, thank you. Would morphology modules use standard 3D formats as output and input like uh, .ply to combine the analyses from and into other tools? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, um, and you know, I should have pointed that out. Um, in the example I showed, we're looking at 2D images and there are limitations that we pretty much just can't get around. Um, once the leaves start overlapping each other or if you have grasses that tiller so you have all these neighboring stems. The, the overlap in 2D becomes very hard or impossible to deconvolute. And so the morphology package doesn't deal with that well. Um, so I, I, the, based on the question, I, the, the definitely obvious thing to do would be to measure these in 3D instead. We, we're starting to work with that. Um, our belief is that the algorithms we're using for the 2D will work in 3D without a lot of modification, um, but we haven't tested that. And I believe we were going to be testing that with PLY uh, data. Okay, thank you. Um, how accurate is plant CV in estimating above ground biomass using only VIS or visual images? Um, our paper, the paper we had in uh, molecular plant in 2015 with Soteria um, showed that for Soteria it was quite accurate. I mean, like the linear model had like an R squared value of greater than 0.9. Um, I've seen some other species where it doesn't work quite as well, but it's usually quite robust. Um, and, and that's not just plant CV. I've, I've, lots of people have uh, shown that you can estimate above ground biomass uh, pretty well with image data, as long as you measure like sort of the right component traits to build a model around, but it, it's quite accurate. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is about, will this recording be available? And yes, it will be. We'll post that on our uh, webinar website uh, later today, hopefully. Um, the next question is, is there a plan to develop plant CV package in R? Um, not that we have, but um, if, you know, like it's, it's completely open and it's open for people to, oh, I'm sorry, I might have actually misinterpreted the question a bit. Um, we we do do so like plant cv really is only doing the measurements from the images and so something i did gloss over is those measurements are then exported as text files that are compatible with reading them into r so all of the downstream analysis where you're doing modeling um, or graphing or whatever uh, we do that in r um, we don't have our own like analysis package that that we've developed for R for for plant CV specifically, um, but there are tools like MV App um, that was developed uh, by Magdalena uh, in the tester lab that uh, plant CV output is compatible with. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if the question was related to image analysis in R, which I have seen some groups working on that. Um, if that person still has questions, they can type in a, a follow-up. Um, does the deep learning require annotation to teach or can it work unsupervised or partly supervised? 
So the Mascar CNN method is a supervised algorithm. Um, the, the data set we're using for training comes from two sources. Um, so there's the group from the, um, the CVPPP workshop that has uh, released, I think it's about a thousand images of Arabidopsis that are annotated. Um, and then I need to find the, the reference for this, but there's the group in Australia that um, created a synthetic data set uh, from that data set. And I think it's about 10,000 synthetic images of Arabidopsis. And so we've used that data set for training and actually works quite well on our own images, even though the the um, we have not trained it on any of our own images. The synthetic data actually works quite well. Okay. In the plant CV morphology package, can I use it to measure any morphological feature like seedling roots, or is it only for above ground? It it does work on roots. Um, so. Uh, I mentioned a collaborator, Dominic Sch uh, Schneider at Washington State. He's been using it on, um, actually, I don't know what kind of roots, but seedling roots. So it, it, it should work as long with the caveat, same caveat as above ground. Once the roots are overlapping each other a lot, um, that becomes a hard problem for that package. OK. In terms of deploying UIs that rely on using plant CV modules or workflows, what do you suggest um, to, or support for outside Jupyter Notebooks? Um, so, I, I mean, since it's just a Python package, I, I think, you know, it would be compatible with any kind of UI system that can that can use um, Python functions. So I, that should include both like uh, desktop interfaces like, uh, like tkinter um, or PyQt um, and also web, web, uh, web front ends like Django and things like that. We, we haven't done any kind of UI development ourselves with Plant CV, although that, that request has come up a lot. Uh, if someone was interested in working on that also, that would, that would be great, because I know that there is, um, there, there's a, a sizable part of the community that would like something like that. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you have any experience using Plant CV to phenotype plants grown under purple LED lights? Hmm, you know, um, I do not directly. Um, we, we, you know, some of our growth chamber systems do have like a uh, skewed sort of light spectrum. Like, so like if you have like a, what metal halide lights, you get a pretty strong like orange red spectrum. Um, and I have not found it to be a problem because we, we don't, Plant CV is not centered around the idea that we should segment plants based on how, on their greenness. So we, we don't rely on the fact that plants are green to do segmentation. So as long as you can differentiate the plant from the background in some property of the image, then it, it can still work. Okay. Uh, what kind of morphological parameters can I get with plant CV? Um, so you can get things, I mean, the, the basic shape information is like area, um, the, the bounding polygon around the plant. Um, which then lets you measure things like solidity. So how sparse is the, the plant structure, um, height and width and properties like um, various kind of bound, like minimum bounding shapes around it. And then with the morphology package specifically, 
the idea was, is to measure uh, leaf length, so the path length of the leaf, um, how curved the leaf is. Um, uh, what's the, I'm trying to remember what that's called now. No, anyway, it's basically the ratio of the path length over the Euclidean distance between the endpoints of the leaf. And then um, the, the leaf stem angle, the um, angle of like the top curved part of the leaf, I think we call it the tangent angle. I'm trying to think if there's any other components of that, but things like that. Or the length of the stem too, because we, I mean, we identify the leaf and stem as separate segments. So um, you can measure the height of a plant using like, say in their grass, like the comb height. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the final question, what is the best standard of practice for, oops, sorry, another one just popped up, for image acquisition so that the images are amenable to analysis in plant CV? Yeah, that's always a great question. Um, I don't, we don't have one set of guidelines per se, but the most important thing is consistency which I know isn't always possible. Like if you're doing, if you're doing outdoor imaging, it's a lot harder to maintain consistency because you can't control the sun. But um, consistency means that, lack of consistency means you need algorithms to do more work to help you get what you need. Um, so when you can control the environment, the more consistent you are, the less you have to rely on algorithms to sort of get around variability. So that's one thing. And when someone's starting a project, what we recommend is, like with anything you're doing, it's important to collect some pilot data. Then you can try using Plant CV with the pilot data. It's it's usually pretty straightforward, or it's usually very apparent then to yourself and, and whatnot that what's working and what's not working uh, in your images. And then you can adjust the imaging. And if you do a few rounds of of that, you can usually get to a pretty good place where you're happy with the images and how much effort you have to put into Plant CV to sort of uh, work with that data set, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. we're, we're always happy to, to, if people send us example pictures, we're happy to, to give advice to about things we might change or, or approaches you might might it might take with Plant CV to analyze that data. Right. I think people often forget that uh, cyber infrastructure platforms often have a very key component, which is the people behind it. Right, right. right. Um, can Plant CV be applied to detection of presence or absence of aphid strips on the surface of the leaf? Hmm. I, you know, we haven't tried that. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I think some of that will depend on your imaging because I, I know that those insects are quite small, especially the thrips. Um, close up, the thrips, you know, are definitely a different color. They're kind of orange is my recollection. So I think in theory, if you could get a small enough, like a zoomed in enough picture, you could see them. I, I'm not sure if you could tell, you know, from a, like a macroscopic view of the plant. Yeah. And, um, can image processing be automated such that if I have hundreds of images, I can just upload them and process? TV? That is the dream. You know, one day um, we don't have a we don't have like what we would call the easy button, which is where you could just plug data into Plant CV and it could sort of figure out how to deal with it in an unsupervised way. Um, so for now, those systems kind of exist, but I, I would say in my experience, they tend to be focused on a, on a narrower problem. So like if you take your images in a certain way, you can upload the data and it can do a specific analysis on that data. With Plant CV, our goal is to be like more we're more generalist. So because you could use Plant CV to do 
like to, to do a lot of different problems, it's it requires the user to to develop that workflow. Okay. Um, it's the top of the hour and I have to end now. There are a few other questions. Um, please feel free to reach out directly to, to Noah and his team. Um, and like I said, we will post this video uh, on our website later today. So um, without further uh, questions, I just wanna let people know that in two weeks, uh, we'll have another webinar featuring Ritu Tuteja a cyber science analyst who will introduce the basic principles of analyzing and handling chromatin immunoprecipitation sequencing, otherwise known as ChIP-seq uh, data, and how to use some of the public apps in the cyber's discovery environment to process and interpret your ChIP-seq data. To register and for more information, go to our website for the uh, webinar. Thanks everyone, really appreciate Noah's uh, wonderful presentation and thank you for all the great questions. See you back here in a couple weeks. Yeah, thank you everybody.